Thrift by Samuel Smiles Masters and Men Part Two Great men are wise savers and wise spenders. Montesquieu has said of Alexander, quote, He found the first means of his prosperity and power in the greatness of his genius, the second in his frugality and private economy, and the third in his immense liberality to accomplish great objects. He spent but little on himself, but for public purposes his hand was always open. End quote. It was also said of the first Napoleon that he was economical like Charlemagne because he was great like Charlemagne. Napoleon was by no means a spendthrift except in war, but he spent largely in accomplishing great public undertakings. In cases such as these, economy and generosity are well combined. And so it is in the cases of all men possessed of energy, industry, and great powers of organization— it may seem out of keeping to compare great producers with great commanders, yet the manufacturer often requires as much courage, as much genius, as much organizing power as the warrior. The one considers how he shall keep his operatives in working order, the other how he shall keep his soldiers in fighting order. Both must be men of enterprise, of boldness, of keen observation, and close attention to details. And the manufacturer, from his position, needs to be the most benevolent man of the two. Viewed in this light, we regard Sir Titus Salt not only as a captain of industry, but as a field marshal of industry. He has been called the prince of manufacturers. Titus Salt is a son of a Yorkshire wool stapler. In the early part of his life he was a farmer near Bradford, and his inclination for agricultural pursuits was such that it was thought he would continue to pursue this vocation. Being, however, a partner with his father in the wool business, and observing that manufacturers were rapidly extending into the neighborhood, he withdrew from the partnership and commenced business at Bradford as a wool spinner. He was one of the first to observe the use of alpaca wool. Large quantities of that material were stored at Liverpool, imported from the Brazils. But the wool found no purchasers, until at length Mr. Salt bought a quantity and spun it into an entirely new fabric. He then proceeded to buy up all the alpaca that was to be found in Liverpool, made arrangements for purchasing all that came into the market, went on spinning alpaca, and eventually established the manufacture. This was the foundation of Mr. Salt's fortune. At length, after about twenty years' labor as a manufacturer, Mr. Salt thought of retiring from business and again betaking himself to his favorite agricultural pursuits. He intended to retire on his fiftieth birthday, but before that time had arrived, having five sons to provide for, he reversed his decision and resolved to continue in business a little longer and to remain at the head of the firm. Having come to this determination, he made up his mind to leave Bradford. The borough was already overcrowded, and he did not like to be a party to increasing the population. He looked about for a site suitable for a manufacturing establishment, and at length fixed upon a large piece of ground in the beautiful valley of Ayr. An extension of the Leeds and Bradford Railway was in front, and the Leeds and Liverpool Canal behind it, so that there was every convenience for bringing up the raw materials and of sending away the manufactured goods. On that spot, Saltaire was erected, a noble monument of private enterprise, liberality, and wisdom. It is not necessary to describe Saltaire. The buildings connected with the new works cover six and a half acres. The principal room is 550 feet long. The weaving shed covers two acres. The combing shed occupies one acre. Everything is large, roomy, and substantial. The cost of constructing the factory and the dwellings for the work people amounted to more than 140,000 pounds. On the opening day, Mr. Salt dined 3,500 persons in the combing shed. At the dinner, he said, I cannot look around me and see this vast assemblage of friends and workpeople without being moved. I feel greatly honored by the presence of the noblemen at my side. 
i am especially delighted at the presence of my work people i hope to draw around me a population that will enjoy the beauties of this neighborhood a population of well-paid contented happy operatives i have given instructions to my architects that nothing is to be spared to render the dwellings of the operatives a pattern in the country and if my life is spared by divine providence i hope to see satisfaction contentment and happiness around me this promise has been amply fulfilled mr salt has been influenced throughout by his sense of duty and responsibility when he was applied to by the french government for information as to his factory he replied what has been attempted at saltaire arose from my own private feeling and judgment without the most remote idea that it would be made the subject of public interest and inquiry with respect to the factory itself little need be said the object of its construction is to save time in the process of production not a minute is lost in pushing the material from one department to another every horsepower of steam is made to do its utmost every moment of time is economized and the productive capabilities of the factory are thus greatly increased we prefer to speak of the immense improvement which mr salt or rather sir titus salt has effected in the physical and moral condition of his work people the plan of the works shows that saltaire has been provided with a church a wesleyan chapel and a literary and philosophical institution large schools have been provided for boys girls and infants with abundance of playground for young men as well as old there is a cricket ground bowling green and croquet lawn surrounded by pleasure grounds there is also a large dining hall baths and wash houses a dispensary and almshouses for pensioners about three thousand persons are employed in the works and seven hundred and fifty six houses have been erected for their accommodation the rents run from two and fourpence to seven and sixpence a week according to the accommodation some of the houses are used as boarding houses the rents include rates and water supply and gas is sold at a low price the cottages are built of stone lined with brickwork they contain a parlor or long room a kitchen or scullery a pantry and cellar and three bedrooms each house has a separate yard with the usual offices the work people are well able to pay the rents single workmen earn from twenty four to thirty five shillings a week a family consisting of a father and six children earn four pounds four shillings a week or equal to a united income of over two hundred and twenty pounds a year the comfortable houses provided for the work people have awakened in them that home feeling which has led them to decorate their dwellings neatly and tastefully a sure sign of social happiness every visitor among the poor knows how such things combine to prevent vice and disease to elevate the moral tone of working people and to develop their intellectual powers a man in a dirty house says mr rind the medical attendant at saltaire is like a beggar in miserable clothing he soon ceases to have self-respect and when that is gone there is but little hope great attention is paid in saltaire to education even of the higher sort there are day schools night schools mutual improvement classes lectures and discussions music one of the most humanizing of pleasures is one of the most favorite studies in almost every house in the town some form of musical instrument is found and indeed the choral and glee societies together with the bands have become household names there is one full brass band for men and another drum and fife band for boys and concerts vocal and instrumental are regularly given by the work people in the dining hall the bands have instructors provided by the firm besides taking part in the musical performances a large number of the skilled workmen devote their leisure hours to various scientific amusements such as natural history taxidermy the making of philosophical instruments such as air pumps models of working machinery steam engines and articles of domestic comfort while some have even manufactured organs and other musical instruments there is no drinking house in saltaire so that the vices and diseases associated with drunkenness are excluded from the locality 
the diseases peculiar to poverty are also unknown in saltaire everything is attended to drainage cleansing and ventilation there are baths of all kinds plunge baths warm baths turkish baths and douche baths and the wash house to enable the women to wash their clothes away from their cottages is a great accommodation inasmuch as indoor washing is most pernicious and a fruitful source of disease especially to the young the workpeople are also thrifty they invest their savings in the penny bank and savings bank whilst others invest in various building societies gas companies and other lucrative undertakings in fact they seem to be among the most favored of human beings with every convenience and necessity as well as every proper pleasure provided for them with comfortable homes and every inducement to stay at home with fishing clubs boating clubs and cricket clubs with schoolrooms literary institutions lecture hall museum and classrooms established in their midst and to crown all with a beautiful temple for the worship of god there is no wonder that saltaire has obtained a name and that sir titus salt has established a reputation among his fellow men there are a large number of employers who treat their workpeople quite as generously though not in such a princely manner as sir titus salt they pay the uniform rate of wages help and encourage the employed to economize their surplus earnings establish savings banks and penny banks for their use assist them in the formation of cooperative associations for the purchase of pure food at a cheaper rate build healthy cottages for their accommodation erect schools for the education of their children and assist them in every method that is calculated to promote their moral and social improvement mr edward ackroyd formerly m p for halifax is another manufacturer who has exercised a great influence throughout yorkshire by his encouragement of habits of thrift among working people in his own district at copley and halley hill near halifax he has built numerous excellent cottages for his workmen and encouraged them to build their own houses by investing their spare earnings in building clubs he has established cooperative clubs to enable the men to purchase food and clothing at cost price he has built excellent schools at his own expense and provided them with a paid staff of teachers he has built and endowed the very fine church of all souls sir gilbert scott architect to which a large district inclusive of the works has been assigned he has provided for his work people both at halley hill and copley a literary and scientific society a mutual improvement society a working men's library to which he has presented more than five thousand books a working men's club and newsroom a choral society supplied with an excellent library of music a recreation club provided with a bowling green and a cricket grounds with quoits and gymnastic apparatus mr ackroyd has also allotted a large field to his workmen dividing it into small gardens varying from a hundred to two hundred and forty square yards each the small rent charged for each plot is distributed in prizes given at an annual flower show held in his grounds for the best growers of flowers plants and vegetables hence the halley hill horticultural and floral society one of the most thriving institutions of the kind in the neighborhood in short mr ackroyd has done everything that a wise and conscientious master could have done for the purpose of promoting the moral and spiritual welfare of the four thousand persons employed in his manufactories who have been virtually committed to his charge but although mr ackroyd has done so much as a master for the men and women employed by him he has perhaps done still more as a public benefactor by establishing the yorkshire penny bank for savings as early as the year eighteen fifty two mr ackroyd instituted a savings bank to enable his workpeople to deposit sums of from one penny upwards the system was found to work so well and to have such a beneficial effect in making people provident that he conceived the idea of extending its operations throughout the west riding of yorkshire having obtained the cooperation of several influential gentlemen the scheme was started in eighteen fifty six and an act of parliament was obtained for constituting the yorkshire penny savings bank 
as it now exists mr ackroyd has recently furnished an introduction to the narrative of the yorkshire penny bank from which we extract the following passage Quote, the way by which thoughts or chance suggestions enter into the minds of men is sometimes passing strange they may be the offspring of wayward fancy or they may be the whisperings from a higher source to the latter cause i am willing to attribute the idea which flashed across my mind during the present year to give to the public something beyond the bare outline of the scheme in which for years many of them have taken a warm personal interest it occurred in this wise when in town i occasionally attended during lent the services at whitehall chapel for the sake of hearing the lenten sermon preached by one of her majesty's chaplains one remarkable sermon of the series was delivered by the rev charles kingsley on the twelfth of march on behalf of the supplemental ladies association of the london society of parochial mission women in the sketch which the preacher gave of this excellent institution he referred to the book entitled east and west in which the benefits derived by the london poor from the association are clearly set forth but he dwelt chiefly on the wide separation which divides rich from poor class from class in london and on the dangers which threaten society from this cause as was recently exemplified in france such was the impression made upon me by the sermon that before many days had lapsed i had purchased east and west and given the book a careful perusal from previous observation i had been struck with the sad contrast between the luxurious lives of those who reside at the west end of london and the struggle for a hard wretched existence which the crowded poor at the east or in close purlieus elsewhere are obliged to maintain until death closes the scene how to bridge over the wide chasm intervening between the extremes of high and low in society without injury to self-respect on either side was a puzzling question the problem to be solved yet from the admirable introduction of this most useful little work by the countess spencer it appeared that a lady of high rank and her noble-minded associates had in some measure solved the problem and bridged over the chasm hence i was led to reflect how much easier it is to discharge our duty to our neighbors and to fulfill the leading object of the parochial mission women association to help the poor to help themselves in provincial towns and in the country where we are personally acquainted with each other than in london where we do not know our next-door neighbor to help the poor to help themselves is the cardinal principle of the yorkshire penny bank End quote footnote a quotation from the yorkshire penny bank a narrative with an introduction by edward ackroyd m p and footnote the business of the bank commenced on the first of may eighteen fifty nine at the end of the year when the bank had been in operation seven months twenty-four branches had been opened it went on increasing in the number of branches and depositors and in the amounts deposited in 1874 about 250 branches had been established and the amount of investments in the name of trustees had reached nearly four hundred thousand pounds the yorkshire penny bank does not interfere with the post office savings bank it has a special function that of teaching the young of either sex the habit of saving it is also convenient to the adult worker as a convenient receptacle for his savings many have been induced to save in consequence of the banks having been brought almost to their very doors one of the most remarkable facts connected with the history of penny banks is the sympathetic influence of juvenile thrift upon paternal recklessness and intemperance the fact is well worthy the consideration of temperance advocates who would probably effect much greater practical good by enabling working people to save their money in the penny banks than by any speech-making agency take for instance the following illustrations from mr ackroyd's narrative an actuary says quote, all the juvenile depositors seem inclined to take care of their pence by depositing them in the bank and the grown-up people have become of the same turn of mind rather than carry their loose money to the public house or spend it foolishly 
some factory operatives have saved sufficient to buy stock and commence farming another actuary says quote, a drunken father being shamed out of his drunkenness by the deposits of his children now deposits half a crown a week in the bank a notoriously bad man a collier became a regular depositor himself as well as depositing money in the name of his child all his spare money having previously been spent in drink from the date of his beginning to save a perceptible improvement took place in his conduct and character in another case two boys prevailed upon their father also a collier to allow them to deposit a shilling a week until they had saved sufficient to buy themselves each a suit of new clothes before then all their father's earnings as well as their own had been spent in drink an actuary of another branch says he has seen fathers and mothers who have been drunkards send their children with money to the bank he says quote, my heart was made to rejoice when i saw a boy who never had a suit of new clothes in his life draw out his money and in less than two hours return well clad to take his place in the school to practice singing for good friday at the meeting of the band of hope on good friday he asked the parents and children to signify by holding up their hands whether or not the bank had been beneficial to them when many hands were instantly raised one poor mother exclaimed i will put up both my hands for my two bairns a miner the father of a family reclaimed from drunkenness saved his money in the bank until with the aid of a loan from the building society he built two houses at a cost of four hundred pounds the bank has been to many people what the hive is to the bee a kind of repository and when the wintry days of sickness or adversity befall them they have then the bank to flee to for succor a missionary says i met a man and his wife about two years ago both drunk i got them to sign the pledge and since then to invest their money in our bank the pawnbroker had got the greater part of their goods but i am happy to say that they have got all the articles out of pawn and can bring a little money almost every week to the bank and when putting in the money the man says that it is better than taking it to the public house their home is now a very comfortable one a drunkard one night came to the bank and flinging down a shilling for a start said there that is the price of six pints of beer but i promise the landlords that they shan't have as much of my money as they have had this man has become sober and continues a regular depositor in another bank a man who had been a reckless and desperate fellow was induced by his wife to deposit a few coppers in the bank he did so and his weekly deposits increased while at the same time his visits to the public house decreased in the course of a short time he had a respectable balance to his credit and this induced him to take a share in a building society and then a second share after continuing to pay upon these shares for some time he purchased a piece of land upon which he built two houses one of these he occupies himself and the other he lets besides this he is now a respectable tradesman having two or three journeymen and an apprentice working for him he is sober and steady and much respected by his friends and neighbors many other cases of the same kind might be mentioned in one case a boy saved sufficient money to buy a suit of clothes for his father who had spent all his earnings in drink and reduced himself and his family to poverty in other cases sons and daughters maintain their infirm parents without resorting to the parochial board for assistance some save for one thing some for another some save to emigrate some to buy clothes some to buy a watch but in all cases frugality is trained until savings becomes habitual one of the yorkshire actuaries of the penny bank tells the following anecdote as conveying a lesson of perseverance and encouragement to branch managers Quote, mr smith was one of our first managers but after attending two or three times he left us saying it was childish work my answer was it is with children we have to do a short time after i met him and in the course of conversation i observed that i sometimes got down in the mouth and did not know whether we were doing any good and felt disposed to give up the bank 
on which he warmly replied for god's sake you must not let such an idea get into your head you little know the good you are doing we have not a man about our place but either himself or some members of his family are depositors the actuary adds if colonel ackroyd ever despairs i give him the above answer End quote. Savings banks have thus been the means of doing an immense amount of good. They have brought peace, happiness, and comfort into many thousands of families. The example of Mr. Ackroyd should be largely imitated, and there ought not to be a county in the kingdom without its organized system of penny banks. End of Section 17, Masters and Men, Part 2